Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first installment of the K Perpetua Speaker Series. Uh, we will be hosting these presentations, a variety of presentations from land and sea, um, covering topics uh, linked to and around the ocean um, and uh, the forest and the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. And today we will be hearing from Jesse Jones on King Tides in Your Neighborhood. And our next presentation will be next Saturday, November 13th. Uh, hearing from Andrea Sharp on saving Big Creek and saving the Oregon silver spot butterfly. Um, I just like to do a land acknowledgement um, that the Cape Perpetua area landscape from Yahats to Florence is the traditional territory of the Siletz tribe and the Coos Lower Umpqua and Sayuslaw tribe. And we do want to acknowledge uh, that the tribal governments um, and their roles historically to, and today in taking care of these beautiful lands. A little bit about Cape Perpetual Collaborative. Uh, first, my name is Tara DuBois. I'm the Communications Coordinator for the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. Uh, it's my pleasure to coordinate this series with you. Um, and the Collaborative's vision is to foster conservation uh, within local communities for scientific exchange, management, awareness, and stewardship from the land and sea in and around the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. Um, our three guiding principles are community engagement, leveraging resources and engaging in partnerships. Um, and at the bottom here, you can see a variety of partners. Um, and these are our founding partners who came together um, to share the work that they were doing around the, the area. Um, and we also have a variety of local business partners um, and local governments as well. Um, again, a little bit about the Marine Reserve now. Our focus of the collaborative is around the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. This Marine Reserve uh, is the largest in Oregon and stretches from Yahats to Florence. Look at that gorgeous scenery. Um, you can see here on the left, uh, it's a little uh, visual of the boundaries. Um, so the Marine Reserve is an area where there's no take of any wildlife. Uh, or anything, any resources, and no ocean development. And to the north and south, there's also marine protected areas uh, where some take can occur. Um, it de varies depending on the marine protected area, but there's still no ocean development allowed. Um, and the image you can see here on the right, this is a little snapshot of what you might find underwater. So if you were to take a dive underwater in the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve, uh, well, it may be a little murky, especially on days like we've been having where the water's been really wild, um, but you'll see not much kelp um, and you'll see mostly rock, sand, and gravel. And there's also an isolated rocky reef. You can see these little dark spots, an isolated rocky reef that's completely contained within the marine reserve. And that's very unique to, the, to this marine reserve. And also hosts uh, some of the most biologically diverse uh, creatures on the, uh, in the inner tidal zone. Uh, so it's a very, very special area. Uh, the collaborative hosts a variety of community science at Cape Perpetua. Uh, you can see here all the different activities. Um, and these are, some of them are seasonal, some of them are year round. Um, but do take a look on our website at capeperpetualcollaborative.org and just click on our events tab and that's where you'll find our calendar. Uh, we will post all of our events, presentations and whatnot on that calendar. Um, so feel free to go there and see what's coming up. Um, but we are also at this time hosting our Young Scientists webinar series, uh, where we host uh, some grad students and postdocs on their ocean research. Um, and that's the second Tuesday of the month, October through April. And we have our upcoming land sea symposium that's coming up on November 18th. And we've got a really great lineup there. And again, you can find out more on our website. Uh, always like to encourage folks to join us on our social accounts. Uh, we have a Facebook page, Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve, and our YouTube channel, which is where this uh, presentation will be posted uh, next week, as well as uh, re replays of our past presentations as well. And if you feel inclined or you like the work that we're doing, uh, we do accept donations. There's a donate button on our website at the top right um, that you can just click and that will take you through our uh, through the process there if you're inclined. And with that, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Jessie Jones. Um, she is Oregon Shores 
Coast Watch volunteer coordinator. Uh, she's a lifelong Oregonian and has a career devoted to the watersheds of Oregon's North Coast. She has managed large and small habitat restoration projects, engaged countless property owners in land conservation, and worked alongside youth of all ages in the natural world. Uh, Jessie's a naturalist and was a private guide for Haystack Rock Awareness Program, Chair of Surfrider Foundation North Coast Chapter, and Chair of the nonprofit organization Pelican Science, which she helped to found. And she is also, not incidentally, a college artist, a collage artist, poet, and bossa nova musician. And with that, Jesse, I'm going to let you take it over. Welcome so much. Thank you for joining me today. Um, and that. you are welcome to pop your screen up now and talk, share it with us some King Tides information. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tara. That was a great introduction. Very nice. And it's great to be here. Um, <clears throat> I miss being there in person. I think I gave a presentation two years ago. Um, and was able to be in that lovely room there at the at the visitor center. So wonderful place. So thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be talking about King Tides to the Cape Perpetua Collaborative. Um, as uh, Tara said, um, my name is Jesse, and I um, am the the Coast Watch Volunteer Coordinator. And Coast Watch is actually a program of Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition, which this year is celebrating 50 years of being a resource to Oregonians, helping to protect our coast, protect access to our coast, and protect the health of our coast. Um, and I'm uh, proud to be working for Oregon Shores. Uh, you can check out more on our website, oregonshores.org. So Coast Watch quickly is a mile by mile beach adoption program. Uh, mile 340 is at Fort Stevens and mile one is at Chrissy Field. So Coast Watch miles are not the same as ODOT miles, not the same as highway miles. It's a little bit of a different system. And we have adopters all up and down the coast. We ask them to observe and photograph their mile um, four times a year. And then uh, if they would like we uh, to be involved in some deeper science, um, we connect them with uh, scientists and researchers all up and down the coast for some uh, citizen science data, collect data collection. So today um, I'm here to talk about the King Tides. The King Tides are one of uh, numerous uh, citizen science projects that we coordinate with partners. This uh, particular project, um, we are partners with the Oregon Coast Management Program. And just to tell you, so you might know if you're here, but uh, the first series of King Tides started yesterday um, and goes throughout the weekend. The next series is December 3rd through 5th. And the next one after that is December 1 through 3. And we are going to talk about what a King Tide is now. Thought I would give you a few photos from the area that have been taken over the years. Um, I think that these are all from last year. The King Tide is the highest tide of the year. Um, it's not a scientific name, um, and the King Tides themselves, without the King Tides name, have been around forever. Um, the highest tides of the year during the daytime happen in the winter and typically during November, December, and January. There is about a three-day period where the tides are extremely high, and they're higher when there is a storm surge behind them. Coast Watch Mile 190, this picture might have been taken last year, it might have been taken the year before, and as a part of this presentation, I will be taking you to the King Tides website um, so that you can see more photographs and uh, learn how to submit a picture. So what is the Oregon King Tides Project? 
It's a citizen science project that relies on volunteers to photograph the highest tides of the winter season. And the reason that we do this is to track sea level rise on the Oregon coast and envision how it will impact coastal areas um, now and into the future. You can see here some stairs leading down to the beach. You can also see a, a very large log. These logs get tossed around like toothpicks, um, extremely dangerous. And so as I'm talking about the King Tides project, please keep in mind that safety is a priority. So if you are participating in this project, you wanna take photos from a safe place Often I'll tell folks to maybe do a little bit of recon um, before you go to your spot and see where the safest place might be to, to stand. Uh, the majority of beaches, well, a lot of them, I'm not going to say the majority, but they, there, there won't be a whole lot of beach during the king tide. So you pretty much wanna stay off the beach during these, uh, during these tides. Um, on the Oregon King Tides website, there is uh, a link to some tide tables. We should know our tide tables all year long. Um, king tides are naturally occurring tides that happen when the moon and the sun and the earth are in alignment with each other. And when the moon is in closest part of its orbit to the earth and when the earth is at, at, at its closest alignment to the sun. This creates the highest gravitational pull on the tides. They occur in the summer too, but the reason why we focus on the king tides and photographing them in the winter is for two reasons. One, in the summertime, the highest occurs at night, as I said earlier, so it's not convenient for photos. And two, the big water events and storms happen more in the winter time, And so therefore the tides are more impactful to our Oregon coastal communities. You might also hear king tides called the spring tides. And if you look here on the right side of the screen, uh, the new moon is, that's, that's what's that's this weekend, um, is when these tides pretty much occur during the winter time. So if you hear a spring tide, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the season. That just means those are the highest tides. Here is an example that, uh, of comparison photos. So one of the things that the Oregon Coast Management Program, well, the, King, the Oregon King Tides Project is looking for are comparison photos. And this helps um, in seeing the effects of the tides. So the King Tides of today, uh, one, reason, one way of thinking about them are that they are the regular tides of tomorrow, the average tides of tomorrow. So this is a photograph uh, on the South Coast taken at one of the coves of Cape Arago, I think. Um, and it's a great example of an excellent photo point. And I'm not sure if the bottom photograph is a, is a regular high tide, but I think that is, I don't think that's a low tide. I think that's a high tide. So throughout the year, if you have a location where you would like to know where these, um, like how that area is being affected and you would like to photograph the king tides in that area, take a photograph um, of a regular high tide uh, on another, either in the spring or summer, um, and you can add that to the Oregon King Tides project. So I've mentioned the Oregon Coast Management Program a couple of times. Um, they are a networked program, federally approved coastal program that's administered by NOAA for all states and territories throughout the US. And it's voluntary. It gives states money from the federal government to do coastal management. And the states are allowed to do coastal management in a way um, that fits their state best. Oregon became a federally approved coastal program pretty early. Oregon's coastal zone is watershed based from the crest of the coast range and extends three nautical miles. Um, all cities and counties within this zone must comply with the coastal program, which administ is administered through the DLCD, which is Oregon's land use planning agency. We have 19 planning goals that all cities and counties must comply with. And the last are coastal goals focused on coastal resources. These are estuaries, shorelands, beaches, and dunes, and the ocean. And they serve as the foundation for our 
In addition to cities and counties, all state agencies that have regulatory authority within the coastal zone must also comply. And this includes Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, Department of State Lands, Oregon Parks and Recreation, and more. It's a bottom-up networked program and all agencies and entities work together. And Meg Reed, who is my counterpart um, for the Oregon King Tides program, she works for the Oregon Coastal Management Program and is the Coastal Shores Specialist and helps communities address coastal ha hazards. Um, other partners in this project are Surfrider, Watershed Councils, ACFA, uh, the Oregon Coast Visitors Association, and Lighthawk, which is a nonprofit um, aerial company that flies and helps to take the photos, um, many of which are on the Oregon King Tides website and we'll check those out later. So this is the 12th year um, that Oregon has been uh, photographing the King Tides as part of a citizen science project. We started in uh, 2010 with I think 10 participants and there were 82 photos and we're, we worked up to um, hundreds of volunteers and hundreds of photographs as well. I think we have a total of over 2,500 uh, photographs now on the website. If some of you have been uh, part of uh, the taking photos before and participating in this project, you might remember that earlier there was a Flickr account um, but over the years, Meg and her team have worked really hard to make a more accessible um, website uh, that is much more user friendly. And now you can see all of the photos there. We'll go there soon. Uh, so what are good examples of the of, of photographs to take? This is an example, a great example to Sadak. So areas where there is infrastructure, um, uh, landmark features like fences, walkways along uh, coastal uh, tidal rivers, bays, um, trash cans, flooding coming into parks. Those are photos that are helpful. And this information is used to help uh, city and county leaders to plan for the future. We'll talk about that in a minute. So I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the communities, just kind of give you an example. Um, so here's some graphs from Rockaway Beach. Rockaway Beach is in Tillamook County on the North Coast. Um, and so this is the King Tide series in 2020. And these graphs are provided from Peter Ruggiero, who is actually going to be um, speaking on November 16th about uh, the coastal management, a little bit about the coastal management program and then coastal re resiliency. Um, so these high tides, remember that they, the high, high tides in the winter can occur during other events. So for example, the top red graph is regular high tides over roughly two weeks oscillating over time, too high and too low a day. The green is water runoff. So that's how far up the beach the water goes and the blue is total water level or TWL. And uh, all of these piece, pieces combined. So we're gonna go here to this next one. So you can see that on January 11th, the high tide and the water runoff are high at the same time. So the total water level was over five feet higher than it was on the 10th or 12th. This day was super high water levels during the King Tide series. It was incredibly impactful and it was a particularly intense day on the Oregon coast. So this particular type of event has only happened 10 times um, since 1980 in the Rockaway Beach area. Um, and we have graphs going back to 1980 when we first started getting this really high tide data. And then I have an example of that day. I'll play this a couple of times because it's only six seconds long. And I'm sorry, there's no sound, but you can see this. You can go back and play it one more time. And if you Google um, Rockaway Beach King Tides, there are a number of other photos that are uh, that might not, or videos that might not be on the King Tides website. 
It's another example of a good photograph for how the king tides affect our roadways and infrastructures. This is at the Neat Hearts, or is this Neat Hearts Bay? This might be the Nye Beach turnaround, actually. Sorry, I can't remember. <laughs> okay, so what do we have here next? All right, so how do we use this data and why do we even do this project? So here is an example of some of how we can estimate uh, future floods by using the King Tide photographs. So this is actually in Nehalem, um, which is uh, in, again, in Tillamook County. And you can see here where this A is in the center photograph, that's a stop sign. And then B down here um, is the street. <clears throat> and then you can see over here, and my face might be in the way, so you can move me out of the way or you can just get rid of me to be able to see. You can see some really faint lines, faint yellow lines. That's the expected highest high tide every two years. And this map was put together with photographs. So you can see here on the picture on the left, there's the stop sign, there's A, there's the stop sign, here's B, there's where that is, and then you can see over here. And these photographs, depending on the community and the leaders, <clears throat> these are used to consider permitting, um, to consider things like managed retreat, um, and to really think about the future. This is an example here. This is in Lincoln County um, of the destruction that takes place every year. Um, these erosions that can that that happen um, when the the rough seas are hitting these sandstone cliffs. So before we head to the King Tides website, these are some areas that. Um, around the Cape Perpetua where uh, there may be some need for some photographs. So smelt sands is at the north, which probably many of you know if you are here. I wanted to do a poll to see how many were actually um, maybe coastal residents and how many were tuning in today from other parts of Oregon. I'm curious about that and how many of you actually plan on participating. Um, these photographs and the project, really the point and the goal is to help these local coastal communities. Um, a lot of folks come to the beach uh, during the storms um, because they're just amazing to see. Um, but behind the scenes, a lot of people are uh, contributing to uh, the planning of these communities by taking photos of these uh, storms and these tides. And I wanted to go back for a minute. Um, so right now it's Saturday, we are at November 6th and yesterday, the projected high tide here in Astoria in the afternoon was about 10.1 feet. Today, it's about a little over eight feet. Tomorrow, it will be higher again. So it depends like wherever you are on the coast, even, even a mile or two, like between smelt sands and yahats, it can be a little bit of a different timing. So make sure that you check those tide tables before you head out. And taking a photograph, you know, at the very minute of that projected high tide, you don't have to do that. That tide is going to be high before and after that time, probably, you know, an hour or so. So you have some time um, before and after that exact time. Like if it's 1241, you can go at noon, anytime between noon and 1.30, something like that. And it should be pretty high. Okay. So now I didn't mean to go to that slide. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a stop share and we are going to head to the Oregon King Tides website. Oops, I didn't want to do that. I almost left the meeting. Okay. So let me do a full screen of this. All right. So here is uh, the Oregon King Tides website. Like I said, it's been getting better every year. If you scroll down, um, you can see here the tide map 
And I'm going to show you this. So you can choose a station and you can see uh, what, the, what the tides are and the times for that. This is a wonderful tool. I'm gonna go back to home and we are going to head into the participate here. I wanted to mention um, last year we started uh, a photo contest that was really exciting. And so if you um, submit photos, you are automatically entered into this. I think there is <clears throat> a way to opt out of that uh, when you are uploading your photos. If you do not want to be entered into the contest, you can see some of the winners here on the left. Um, I want to take this opportunity to tell folks so you can see here, this is not a, uh, the beach. This is not a rocky shore here. This is a river and tidal rivers are, we are in need of uh, some of the locations of tidal rivers, also estuaries, bays, bridges. Um, those are all great photographs. And so there's a lot for more information here on this website. And can head to the photo gallery, you can see some of the current season, which just started yesterday. So I'm not sure if those are up yet. Um, there's information here highlighting coastal hazards um, and then all time photos. A lot of the aerial imagery from Skyhawk that I was talking about is on here as well. So here we have, uh, maybe some um, needed photographs, needed areas, needed locations. Not all of them are on here. So if you um, want to know more and you don't see it here, you can go and you can check out the photographs of that, of that area. And actually what I wanted to show you as well was, let's see, hang on just a minute here. Okay, so this is a pretty wonderful feature here. So you can get into, I clicked into photo gallery and then went into um, all time. And you can see here, and you can kind of zoom in and you can see what photos and where they have been taken place. So here I'm clicking here, this is Young's Bay and it should show up most of the photos in this cluster were taken in the winter of 2013 and 2014. So we can go down into your area down here, you can zoom in. And you're kind of getting the drift. I don't want to spend too much time here on the website. I want you all to be able to uh, play around here as well, but you can see how close you can get you can see the photographs. Let's just see, let's go to Agate Beach here. And I should be able to see the photos, but maybe I'm doing it wrong. I've been playing around a lot on this, but you should be able to see these. Okay. Well, that's not working right at this very moment. Let's get into the aerial photos here. Okay. So I'll play around a little bit more with that maybe as we're doing some questions and see if we can find um, those photos. But usually that works really, really well. We can get into these as well, but yeah, okay. Well, that uh, concludes, there's a lot more to talk about. So if there are any questions, um, I think, uh, Let's see if we can um, go there. Hi, Tara. <laughs> so if you have questions, um, do feel free to either add them to the chat or into the Q&A. And Jesse, when you mentioned that you wanted to do a poll of coasties, uh, whether the folks were from the coast or not, a lot of folks did chime in. Uh, a lot of folks oh, coming from, people are coming from uh, Newport, Florence, Coos Bay, Yahats, Waldport, Depot Bay. Um, Charleston, Agate Beach, uh, some folks from California. 
Um, and in the Valley, more in Kaiser and Portland, but who visit the area. Okay. Um, so we looks like we have a mixture, but a lot of Coasties. Great. Let me see here if there's anything else. Nice. Yeah. Oh, someone from Roseburg. Okay. Um, and so I have a question real quick as folks are adding some. Yes. The project's been happening for 12 years now, and mm -hmm. I know research, and it takes several years sometimes to be able to, to determine change that ha takes place. Have Has the King Tides project been able to do any assessment or kind of data analysis to determine, you know, if there has been any change in the rise of the sea um, based on the photos that they've had, or do they have a plan around that? Yes, the Oregon Coast Management is working on that. And we are, so I don't work for them. So when I say we, I say they. <laughs> <laughs> they are, they are. Um, there have been maps created, um, not just the one that I showed you, but um, there have been some maps created. And Meg works closely with leaders um, in the communities. So the communities, if they are, curious if they are concerned they reach out to Oregon Coast Management Program and look at the photographs and kind of assess um, how the flooding is affecting these communities. Um, so as for Oregon I can't really speak exactly to what the Oregon Coast Management Program is. I do know that um, the storms are getting stronger uh, but there are some areas of the world where the sea level rise is happening a lot faster. And we're, see, we're seeing some of that, but the way that they are measuring that is through these high tides. So um, every year, um, the reach may come in further. And I don't know um, what that is showing quite yet. It'll be interesting to see. Um, when more of that and I'm looking forward to Peter's talk on the 16th uh, because he's him and Meg have been working on that quite a okay. quite a bit. Nice and for those Cape Perpetua locations that Jesse showed um, and any location I just want to reiterate safety again because a lot of the beaches and access points are lower lying beaches that uh, even the parking lots at sometimes can, you know, the tide comes up that high. So do be very careful mm -hmm. um, when you're out there, particularly if there's a storm surge coming through. Okay, so um, here's a question. Are king tides getting progressively worse as the years go on? So that is, I want to say, yes, we are seeing more powerful storms occur. So this has to do with sea level, uh, with actual with, te with with temperature change happening in our in our in our oceans. The temperatures are getting warmer, and this is affecting um, how strong the the winds are, and then how high the waves are. So the the, the storms are getting pro progressively worse on the Oregon coast as well. Mm hmm. Um, and someone did mention here, thanks for this, Margaret, um, that you can refer to uh, Meg's presentation from Cape Falcon from last year as well. Um, they may have some more information on there from Meg. Okay, a couple more questions. Is the sea level showing much rise yet uh, due to global warming, just in general? So do you know, these might you might not know all these answers. Right. <laughs> so what's the question? Is a sea level, what, what was sea, the question? Is sea level showing much rise yet due to global warming? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Yes. Um, Oregon is, like I said, there are different parts of the world that are showing this more. Um, there are some communities um, that are living with like uh, constant flooding. And we are seeing this more during our high tides, which is why this particular project is our way, is Oregon's way and California's way. And, um, uh, and a number of, there are King Tides projects that are happening around the world. And they use the King Tides to see and determine the, 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 the future sea level rise. So, 
Yes, we are seeing we are seeing higher tides. We are seeing further um, reach of these tides into our communities over the years. Yeah, that video you showed was kind of scary. I mean, the water's coming up and around the house. Um, right. So and yeah, and that house that, <laughs> that house was built um, probably where it shouldn't have been. Um, right. And so there are some communities who are really taking uh, these. Um, taking sea level rise and climate change um, pretty seriously and thinking about how that's affecting these communities that are that are close to the coast, how or well, very close to the beach. Mm -hmm. And then for folks who want to participate in the project, do they need to contact somebody to participate? No, they can simply um, head here. So we will go here. So into the in the participate tab here. Um, here is where the King Tides photo submission and the photo permission. So if you would like that and the contest permission, and then you can add your name here. And then uh, it's probably easiest to do this on your computer. So you're going to select the file and then you will upload it. And what's really great is that you can see here, they ask for a photo location. Um, and what I'm doing is I am simply using my mouse and I'm clicking on a location. And you can see here that it auto fills the latitude and longitude. So you don't have to know exactly um, where you were. You don't have to, you, you didn't have to take those, uh, the, the lat long when you were there at your spot. You can simply locate your spot and if you want to get, you know, all of this, this tool is wonderful. You can just see exactly where you were standing to take that high tide photograph. So if you were standing here on the bridge, that's where you would click. And then it just automatically fills it here. And you can also do a search um, with an address here as well. Very nice. And then it'll give you, um, so I just typed in Yahats and it'll give you that location right there. And then you can, if you wanna get closer because you were in and around this area, but you were standing on a certain street, like let's say you were standing right here, you click on that and that changed it. Also um, where the direction facing when the photo was taken, so depending on where you are, you might think, well, obviously we're all going to be looking west, but depending on if you're standing on a, on a, a point or an, a head, or even, even if you're like are looking kind of up river, you might be looking northeast, you might be looking southeast. So be sure that you fill that part out. And then you have the date here. And then if you notice anything, um, if you are, are taking, let's say you're taking a, a photograph from a bridge, um, and you can see that you would click infrastructure, probably some flooding if you see the water kind of over uh, a walkway um, that happens pretty, pretty frequently, actually. And then you can caption it yourself. So here is that. Put your a caption of, of the location and what you are seeing. And then you can also add... Um, a little bit of a longer, uh, you know, something that you noticed while you were standing there. You would like to, you know, a little additional narration. Feel free to put that in there. As I was talking before, um, the comparison photos are great to have. So here we have, um, maybe you went out and you took a photo a comparison from a site. So here you have the average high tide here. And is it a king tide photo? Is it an average tide? Um, regular high tide or a storm event. So like I was saying, sometimes uh, like I know that in October we had, there was a pretty big storm and we had some high tides and it wasn't an official king tide, but they were high tides. So get out there safely and take photos. Of, if, if there's a storm event, you can take that as well. And then put your email address here and then simply click submit. And if you have any questions about this, contact myself, or Meg Reed, and I believe um, on this, there should be a contact here, but the contact, um, I think it's Oregon King Tides, info at Oregon King Tides, and I can find that as well, but it should be on here. And those go straight to Meg. 
And so, I did go ahead and plug the link in to OregonKingTides.net into the chat. So you can just copy and paste if you want. And I also uh, dropped in Jesse's email if you, you had any much. questions. Um, but that looks Rick, nice and easy enough to be able to submit. A yes. Photo. Such a yeah, one. it's great. It works. It just, it works wonderful. So let us know if you do have any questions. I miss it when Meg is not co-presenting with me. So <laughs> yeah. thank you for putting up with some of my, <laughs> some of my answers. Um, but uh, if you do have more and more questions about sea level rise in Oregon, um, climate change in Oregon and how that is affecting our coastline, Oregon Coast Management Program is also there for you as well. So we had a few more questions come in that I want to pass your way. Um, okay. Is sea foam a relevant thing during Keaton tides? A relevant thing? Mm -hmm. Well, it does. It it does happen in the winter time. We'll see. Um, we'll see foam, and that's happening because of the little tiny creatures um, that I am completely spacing on the name of what that what they are right now. But um, it's it is uh, it's they're they're not harmful. Um, and if anyone out there knows uh, what they are called, please stick it in the chat because I'm just uh, I can't remember what they are called. But they're diatoms. That's what they are. So you'll see these diatoms um, that are these. Uh, they're sort of like this dead plant matter, I think, that come up and they're they're churned up and they'll see them blowing on the beach. And um, it's one of those, it's, it's, I, I think they're beautiful to watch. And so those will happen a lot more um, in the winter time. And if I'm wrong about that, please someone out there correct me. <laughs> and how I know of sea foam, yeah, it's just like when, it, when rough waters occur, it's kind of like dead body cells with the mm -hmm. salt and the air kind of all just churned together creates that sea foam. So it is all organic material and it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean things are dirty. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's really lovely actually to see that blowing yeah. around in the winter time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is there extreme low tides uh, like there are king tides? Yes, there are. So in the winter time, um, so there are negative tides all year long and in the winter time they're at night. So if the weather is calm, um, you can head out to the tide pools with your flashlight and safely and find some pretty neat finds at night. And the summertime, those happen during the day. And so in the summer, there are some very high tides, but they are all occurring at night and the low tides are happening during the day. And I wanted to kind of do a little plug here for, we, we have a number of um, citizen science projects, as I mentioned, and some of the low tide citizen science projects that um, I know Cape Perpetua Collaborative participates in are the sea star surveys and sea star observations. Um, so I know that Tara does that there, but there are also other locations um, where there isn't a, uh, they're actually pretty simple. It's a simple sea star observation um, that you can take any time of year and just upload your photographs to that. But yes, there are low tides all year long, but it changes on the season depending on whether you are at night or during the day. Yeah, and um, many people will refer to those as, as like negative tides. Um, and it's kind of like the king tides. It'll happen over about, you know, for three months during the summertime. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a sweet time to go tide pooling. Yeah. Um, because so much more gets exposed in that rocky intertidal area. Yeah. Um, is this information being used to recommend annexation into incorporated areas that have water treatment plants versus septic systems? Mm. So that's a great question. And that is up to your community leaders. Um, that is up to the decision makers and it can be up to the communities themselves. So um, this project is being used um, to uh, bring awareness to these communities. And so bringing up the idea of like a sewage uh, plant, that type of thing, uh, settling ponds, those are great areas to photograph for this project. Um, some of these areas are in tidal areas. I live in Astoria and I know the, for a fact that our settling ponds on the east of town um, are affected by these king tides. They come so, so close to these areas. 
So if you can get to these areas and get to them safely, take photographs of these inf of, of the infrastructure, submit them. And if you can uh, share with your local communities, share with your commissioners, share with your county commissioners, your city councils, um, and get them involved and interested as, as well about how these are affecting our communities. So I can't answer that because I'm not a decision maker, but it could be. So depending on what community you are in, um, if you're interested in that, this is a way for you to become involved and bring awareness of, um, of sea level rise and climate change to your the leaders of your community. And I highly encourage you, if you're not able to get out and take photos for this project, share it with others. Um, so that way they know about it. And if they have time or interest, they can also participate. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and with that, it looks like we wrapped our questions. Um, so I just want to thank you again, Jesse, for uh, joining us this morning to share about King Tides. It's a very important project. Um, I had no idea that it was going on for 12 years, so that's really exciting um, <laughs> because the more decades we can document uh, this data, uh, the more well-informed we can be to make some of those hard decisions within the local governments. Um, living on the edge of the sea, you got to pay attention. Uh, yeah. to these changes. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yes. And I hope I was able to answer your questions. And if not, please contact me and I can put you in touch with folks that have the answers to those questions. And be safe out there and please participate in a community near you. If you want ideas for where to go, you can look on the map. And if you can't find anything, um, just feel free to contact me. It's a busy time of year because of the King Tides project. And so I am, I'm available to help out. And thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe and enjoy those awesome King Tides. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Tara.